In this video, we're going to talk about Gregor Mendel's law of segregation and what observations led to this conclusion. Gregor Mendel was one of the first people to accurately analyze patterns of inheritance. He deduced the fundamental principles of the study of inheritance, which we call genetics. Gregor Mendel was doing his research and published his works in 1866. This was well before the discovery of DNA, before the discovery of chromosomes. He didn't know what the physical particles of inheritance were, but he knew some information about the properties that they must have. Gregor Mendel performed most of his research on a specific type of organism. These are garden peas. And he used these organisms for several different reasons. He could easily control the crossing, and this would allow for both self-fertilization and cross-fertilization. They made many offspring each time reproduction happened. They had very fast generation time, so he could get several generations grown in a single growing season. And also, they were cheap and easy to grow. With these organisms, Gregor Mendel carried out both self and cross fertilizations. Now pea plants are hermaphroditic. They produce both male and female gametes in the single flower, and they're capable of self-fertilizing. So the pollen from a flower can fertilize itself, resulting in a fruit, or in the case with the pea plants, resulting in a pea pod filled with seeds or offspring. What Gregor Mendel would do with these cross-fertilizations is that before a flower was able to fertilize itself, he would remove the stamens, remove those sections that would make the pollen or the male gametes. He would then take pollen from another flower and pollinate or fertilize that flower with the removed stamens. In that way, he would know all of the seeds that were produced, all of the offspring. They had genetic material from two different parents. Now, before he would even start this experiment, he would make sure that his starting lines were true breeding. By true breeding, we mean that these plants would produce offspring. Exactly like themselves, exactly like the parents, every time they self-fertilized. So if you had a true breeding pea plant that had purple flowers, if you allowed it to self-fertilize, all of the offspring would have purple flowers. If you'd allow them to self-fertilize, all their offspring would have purple flowers. Yet in that same way, you could have a strain of pea plants that were true breeding for white flowers, and that all their offspring would have white flowers in the next generation, and the next generation after that. He always made sure he was starting with two true breeding lines, but then he asked, what happens if I cross these two? He would cross those two true breeding lines that differed in a single trait. In this case, that trait that he was looking at was flower color. So if he had a purple flowered pea plant and a white flowered pea plant, he knew they were tr from true breeding lines, but then he used the pollen from one to fertilize the eggs of the other. He could then plant those offspring and see what flower color those offspring would have. And when he performed this experiment, he found that always the offspring of those two true breeding lines, they would have purple flowers. This type of a genetic cross is known as a monohybrid cross. It's a cross between parent plants that differ in only one characteristic. So Gregor Mendel performed this cross many times, and consistently he would see the results that the F1 generation, they would all have purple flowers. But then if he allowed those F1 generation to self-fertilize, if they would pollinate their own eggs to produce seeds or to produce that next generation, when he planted that next generation called the F2 generation, most of them would have purple flowers just like the F1. But consistently, white flowered pea plants would show up again. And in fact, those white flowered pea plants would consistently show up in about one quarter of the F2 offspring. 
So this was a pattern that Gregor Mendel saw repeated many times. I'd like to introduce you a bit to the terminology that he used so we can describe this situation that's occurring here. Gregor Mendel would always take these monohybrid crosses to three generations. Now the first generation, he would call the P generation or parental generation. And these were the true breeding lines. Whether they were true breeding for purple flowers or true breeding for white flowers, this is always where he would start. When he would cross two of those true breeding lines together and plant the resulting seeds, the offspring that were formed were known as the F1 generation, or the first filial generation. These were the offspring of the parental generation. And what Gregor Mendel saw is that this F1 generation always showed one particular trait. Again, if we're talking about flower color, the F1 generation were always purple. Even though there was a true breeding purple and a true breeding white pea plant in the pea generation, the F1 only showed one trait, and that was purple. Now, when Gregor Mendel allowed this F1 generation to self-fertilize, and he planted their seeds, well, those offspring became known as the second filial generation, or the F2 generation. These were the offspring of the F1 generation. And what Gregor Mendel saw was that consistently, there was one trait that showed up in the F2 generation of the two possible options from the parents. That one trait that showed up, he called the dominant trait. So in this case, purple flower color is considered dominant to white. If you cross a true breeding purple and a true breeding white flowered pea plant together, all of their offspring had purple flowers. Purple is the dominant trait. Having white flowers, which is considered to be the recessive trait, did not happen in the F1 generation. Instead, that recessive trait skipped the F1 generation. Probably what was most surprising is that when Gregor Mendel allowed the F1 generation to self-fertilize, you might expect all of their offspring to have purple flowers, because everyone in the F1 generation had purple flowers, if you're having them self-fertilize, wouldn't their offspring also have purple flowers? Well, this was the surprising thing. Consistently, that recessive trait, or white flowers, it showed up in the F2 generation, and it showed up in predictable numbers. So Gregor Mendel would consistently see in this F2 generation white-flowered pea plants showing up about one quarter of the time. So again, looking at this cross, purple versus white, both of these are true breeding in the pea generation. Their offspring, all of them, have purple flowers. That's the F1 generation. But then when we allow the F1 generation to self-fertilize, and we look at the F2 generation, we get this consistent ratio of about three quarters of them showing the dominant trait, one quarter of them showing the recessive trait. Now, at first, Gregor Mendel wasn't sure if this was just a quirk of flower color or if other traits would also show this behavior. So he looked at several different traits and he found for flower color, for flower position, for seed color, seed shape, pod shape, pod color, and stem length, all of these seven traits, one of the two characteristics was dominant to the other. That the F1 generation would always show the dominant trait and the recessive trait would show up predictably in about one quarter of the F2 generation. So from these repeated experiments, Gregor Mendel formulated several hypotheses. So these hypotheses that Gregor Mendel came up with, first, he said that there were going to be alternative forms of the heritable characteristic what we call genes, and he called these different forms alleles. So an example of this, if we're talking about the flower color gene, there are two options, the purple flower color allele or the white flower color allele. These are two different versions of that gene, the flower color gene. Now for each characteristic, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. And it turns out it's not just the traits which are dominant or recessive, it's actually the alleles which will be dominant or recessive. 
And so what we mean by this is that if an organism has one of each allele, both the dominant allele and the recessive allele, they will only show the dominant trait. So even if they have the purple flower color allele and the white flower color allele, and purple is dominant to white, that individual will only have purple flowers. The last hypothesis that Gregor Mendel came up with is that gametes each carry only one allele for each inherited characteristic. So there's a few terms that I'd like to introduce, and then we can see how these hypotheses brought Gregor Mendel to his conclusion, what we now know as the law of segregation. And so these terms, the phenotype of an organism is the description of that organism's physical traits, their characteristics. If a pea plant has purple flowers, that is its phenotype. If it has white flowers, that is its phenotype. Whether it's tall or short, yellow seeds or green seeds, those are all examples of phenotype. In contrast, the genotype of an organism is specifically stating which alleles that organism has. If I say an individual has two copies of the dominant or purple flower color allele, that would be an example of genotype. If I say an individual has one copy of the dominant allele, one copy of the recessive allele, that is another example of genotype. In fact, there are some terms we use when describing genotype. The first of these, homozygous, is when an organism has identical alleles for a gene. So if an individual has two copies of the dominant flower color allele, they would be homozygous for that dominant allele. If they have two copies of the recessive allele, they would be homozygous for that recessive allele. In contrast, if an individual has two different alleles, they will be heterozygous. for those alleles. So having one copy of the purple flower color allele and one copy of the white flower color allele, that individual would be heterozygous for that flower color gene. These two terms, homozygous and heterozygous, they are terms we use to describe the genotype of an organism. But remember, phenotype is simply described by the traits or characteristics that an organism has whether they look dominant or look recessive, whether they have purple flowers or they have white flowers. So let's see how these terms are used when we look at the traits and characteristics of pea plants and their flower color. So when we're talking about genotype, again, homozygous can either mean homozygous dominant, having two copies of that dominant allele, in this case, the purple flower color allele, or homozygous recessive, meaning having two copies of that recessive allele, or white flower color allele. Whenever we use the term heterozygous, we don't preface it as heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive, because the name itself tells us that we have one of each. Heterozygous is when the two alleles are not matching. So there are three different possible genotypes, yet there are only two different phenotypes. The flower color will either be purple or white. So when we go back to this cross that Gregor Mendel made, the P generation was always true breeding. Now, another thing that's very important to realize is that in genetics problems and genetics terms, true breeding is actually another way of saying homozygous. If individuals are true breeding, they are homozygous for the trait that they are true breeding for. So if the capital P allele is for purple flowers, and the little p allele is for white flowers, well then, the true breeding purple flowered parent is going to be capital P, capital P, homozygous dominant for the purple flower color allele, whereas true breeding plant with white flowers 
will be little p, little p. It will be homozygous recessive, having two copies of that recessive allele for the white flowers. Now in the F1 generation, these plants will receive one allele from each parent. And then in the F2 generation, we see that there will be most of the offspring showing that dominant trait, having the dominant phenotype, whereas a quarter of them having the recessive phenotype. Now what Gregor Mendel was able to do was to take those observations and to take those hypotheses that he came up with and to come up with what's now known as the law of segregation. And that is that each individual, each parent, will have two alleles for each gene. When that individual makes gametes, when they make sex cells, those gametes will have only one allele for each gene. Using some of the terms we have learned when discussing meiosis, parents are diploid, whereas gametes, the sex cells, the sperm and egg, they are haploid. They will have only one allele for each gene. Now each child, each offspring, will be the result of two gametes fusing together. So the offspring will be diploid, just like the parents were. But part of the genius of Gregor Mendel's law of segregation is that if you have an individual who is heterozygous, having two different alleles, when that individual makes gametes, those alleles will separate from each other evenly. And so half of the gametes will have one allele, half of the gametes will have the other. Even though one allele is considered dominant and the other is recessive, the law of segregation says those two alleles will separate evenly. That F1 individual can make two different types of gametes. Half of the gametes will have the capital P allele, half of the gametes will have the lowercase p allele. The two members of an allele pair segregate. or separate from each other during the production of gametes. And it's actually this even separation of the two alleles, along with the random fertilization that happens during pollinization, that ends up giving us this F2 generation, where when we look at the four possible combinations of sperm and egg, with again half the sperm being capital P, half the sperm being lowercase p, half the eggs being capital P, half the eggs being lowercase p, is that we end up with offspring, of which three quarters of them will look purple and one quarter will look white. Or if we look at the genotypic ratios, one quarter of them will be homozygous dominant, one half will be heterozygous, one quarter will be homozygous recessive. We're actually going to see in the next video how we can take this law of segregation and use it to answer questions about predicted probabilities of genetic crosses. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.